Islamic invasion from Africa, one ultimately thwarted by the arrival of a pure prophet. Guess who? By the serpent of the lava plains, I swear the Ethiopians shall attack. A pure prophet to whom revelation will come from on high will bring it to an end. The devil worshippers professed. An apostle will bring truth and justice among men of religion and virtue. You just can't beat a satanic endorsement. The soothsayers went on to claim prophetically, It will be his intention to destroy the Jews living among him. In poetic verse they warned, In rage against two Jewish tribes who live in Yathrib, who richly deserve the punishment of a fateful day. The satanic crowd who predicted Jews would be victimized by their prophet allegedly acquired these quotes from some rabbis. The approaching army will seek to destroy the temple in Mecca, for we know no other temple in the land which Allah has chosen for himself. The rabbis told Rabbiah to do what the people of Mecca did, circumambulate the Kaaba to venerate and honor it, to shave his head, and to bow down in humility in its sacred precincts. Recognizing the soundness of this advice, the king cut off their hands and feet, and continued on to Mecca. The stubby rabbis are said to have narrated a rather long poem from their sacred books reciting from the Torah. A few lines are intriguing. They correctly defined the Kaaba for what it really was, and for what Muhammad would ultimately do with it. Ishak, a house of ancient wealth in Mecca, treasures I wanted to seize. Then they are said to have authored one of the Quran's most embarrassing lines. Dhul al-Karnain, who is Alexander the Great, before me was a Muslim, with knowledge true. He saw where the sun sinks from view in a pool of mud and fetid slime. While there is considerable evidence, Islam is satanic, having every soothsayer, sorcerer, omenmonger, and astrologer predict the arrival of a pure prophet to whom revelation will come is more blatant a connection than you'd think their scriptures would admit. They even suggest that the devil worshippers were right because, as predicted, an African army did invade Yemen. Here's what even Ishak had to say about them. After building a church, Arbah, an Abyssinian viceroy, led his army north. While the non-Islamic records don't mention a place as insignificant as Mecca, the Muslim sages allege that Arabha wanted to conquer their booming metropolis with the express interest of destroying the Kaaba. They say that the viceroy was bent on luring pre-Islamic Arabs away from idolatry and toward a new Christian cathedral. The very thought of it must have made the rocks of the Kaaba tremble. Arabha is said to have arrived at the outskirts of the town with an army of sorts. But what made him formidable was his ride. The viceroy was mounted on a mighty elephant. And thus far, although grossly misdated, the story is almost plausible. Abyssinia is today's Ethiopia, so its viceroy could well have been mounted upon the mightiest of land mammals. What's not reasonable is that there isn't enough food or water to sustain an elephant in the Arabian desert, at least for the beast to be more of an asset than liability. Details aside, the story gets good at this point. Ishak, Mahmud, that would be the elephant, bowed down whenever it was asked to face Mecca. Then Allah rallied a flock of birds, each carrying a pea-like stone in its beak, and in each claw, everyone who was hit died. They were instantly dissolved, their flesh falling from their bones. Abraha's fingers fell off one by one. Naturally proud of his achievement, Allah, with some help of his pal Muhammad, recounted his stirring victory in the Quran. Quran 105, verse 1. Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the companions of the elephant? Did he not make their treacherous plan go wrong, ending in confusion? He sent against them hordes of flying creatures, pelting them with stones of baked clay. He turned them into stalks of straw, devoured. A hadith describes the nature of the disease. Whoever was struck by a pebble started scratching his body, tearing his flesh. History suggests that the Abyssinian brigade was actually done in by smallpox. Even Islam agrees, in effect calling their god a braggadocious liar. Ishak, Utba told me that he was informed that this year was the first time that measles and smallpox had been seen in Arabia. 
And while that's hardly miraculous, the Islamic tradition affirms a shocking reality. Sixty years before the first Muslim tread the planet, Allah was a pagan god, and the Kaaba, the center of Islamic worship, was a pagan shrine, giving Allah and his house a history that isn't the least bit flattering. Desperate to prove Allah was real, Muslims attributed this bizarre tale to their anemic deity. Good thing they did. As it turned out, this particular story became Allah's only miracle. When Abdul Mutalib, Muhammad's grandfather, Meccan king and Kaaba custodian, heard of the approaching men, he told Allah and his pantheon that they were on their own. Ishak, Allah, you know that we do not wish to fight, for we do not have the ability. A man protects his house, so you protect your house. Don't let their craft overcome your craft tomorrow. Deliver up the black barbarians. Tabati adds, But if you want to leave and change our Qibla... The direction the Meccan idolaters faced in prayer, 75 years before Muhammad insisted it was an Islamic requirement. You may do as you please. On his exodus, Mutalib may have said something like, As for me, I'm out of here. I know the family business is a scam. It's been nice. But we can always stack a new pile of rocks when the invaders are gone. Contrary to the Muslim revisionists, pre-Islamic Arabs were lovers, not fighters. Mutalib is alleged to have told the Quraysh, If we offer no resistance, there will be no cause for bloodshed. Knowing that they were out-muscled, and being merchants, not militants, the Meccans at Mutalib's suggestions scampered out of town and headed for the hills. They let their gods fend for themselves. This should give us pause, because it means that it must have been Islam that turned these pacifists into warriors. Early Muslims, in an effort to commemorate Allah's magnificent achievement, tell us that Muhammad was born in the year of the elephant. They say it is proof that he was a prophet. But that's a problem. If Muhammad was born in 552, the year history says Arabha moved north, he would have been 70 years old when he married his favorite wife, the six-year-old Aisha. And if Muslims need to falsify an event to make Muhammad appear prophetic, what does it say about the veracity of their religion? However, there was a ray of hope in Mecca. Four Arabs had come to recognize that it was high time to stop worshipping stones. The rest of the world had long since gone monotheistic, thanks to the Jews and Christians. These religious leaders, called Hanifs, were natural monotheists. Ishak, Waraka Nafal, Ubaidullah Josh, Uthman Huareth, Zayed Amr, were of the opinion that their people had corrupted the religion of Abraham, and that the stone they went around was of no account. It could not hear, nor see, nor hurt, nor help. They told their people, Find yourselves a religion, for by God you have none. While much of this was encouraging, one line completely destroys Muhammad's credibility and murders Allah. These Hanifs not only inspired the first score of Quranic surahs, they served as Muhammad's link to the notion that Islam was the religion of Abraham, and yet these men said, The stone they went around was of no account. It could not see, hurt, or help. That stone was Allah. A generation before Allah's messengers stole Islam from Qusay's heirs, Arabs in his hometown had it figured out. Their moon rock was no better than moonshine, a source of money and false hope. Nothing more. According to Ishak, Waraka became a Christian. His credibility will soon be usurped to advance Muhammad's agenda. Ubaidullah became a Muslim, rejected Islam the following year, and also became a Christian. Uthman became a Christian as well, holding a high office in the Byzantine Empire. But Zayad stayed where he was. He accepted neither Judaism nor Christianity. He abandoned the religion of his people. As we shall learn, Zayad recited poems that formed the basis of early Quranic surahs. Yet on this day, Ishaq, Abu Bakr said that he saw Zayed as a very old man leaning his back on the Kaaba, saying, O Quraysh, by him in whose hand is the soul of Zayed, not one of you follows the religion of Abraham, but I. O God, if I only knew how you wish to be worshipped, I would so worship you, but I do not know. Then he prostrated himself on the palms of his hands. 
The implications of this hadith are devastating to Islam, especially when we witness the similarity and superiority of Zayed's poetry to that contained in the Quran. Although this hadith's poems predate the Quran, you'll appreciate them more when they're set in the context of Muhammad's first revelation. Some say that material stolen from several sources ceases to be plagiarism and becomes research. If that's true, Islam was Muhammad's research project, as he stole it from Qusay, Zayed, and the Jews.